When we are generous, when we actually give, when we give someone money or we provide for someone or we give towards, when we live generously, it awakens something in our hearts, brings something in us to life that is put there by God himself. And yet for so many of us, it is easier to keep for ourselves. We find this tension between being generous and also being focused on ourself. And the question becomes, why? Why why is there that tension? Why is there that struggle between who we want to be and who we find ourselves consistently becoming? Why is it that there's sometimes a gap between this ideal version of who we are and where we currently are? I talk a lot about formation, and I want to remind us that we are being formed all of the time. We are being shaped into someone. So our day, our current day, our present is shaping us into who we will become in the future. And sometimes that's, it. Sometimes that's intentional. Sometimes we actively think about who do I want to become. But for many of us in many areas of our life, it is deeply unintentional. We just become who we're going to become based on what we're doing, and we don't give a ton of thought to it. And sometimes we think a little bit about it. Sometimes we think about what are the advertisements that I'm taking in. Like you tend to pay attention, and you tend to notice, okay, what are they trying to sell me? And and if you're paying careful attention, you go, I see, I see what's behind this. You're not really selling me this idea of a perfect life. You're saying you have the solution, and if I just give you enough money, you'll solve all my problems. Maybe we pay attention to that. Or maybe we pay attention to the social media that we engage in and increasingly find at times this disconnection, and you go, that's not real life. Or or maybe it's the news that we consume. And if we pay careful attention, we realize that ultimately the the real product is you and just trying to get our attention and our outrage. And so we see different sides of the political spectrum trying to point us at each other to go, they're the enemy. And so you pay attention to how that forms you. And you start to notice, you know, if I'm not watching the news all the time, I tend to be a less anxious person. And if I'm not on social media all of the time, I tend to compare myself a lot less with others. And if I'm not looking constantly at advertisements, I tend to not want as many things. Like we may pay attention to some of that. But how much do we pay attention to the way that we spend our money and how it forms us? Because the way that we spend our money, our generosity actually does something to us. Your spending forms what you focus on, what you care about, and what you prioritize. How we spend our money forms us. And this is how we were designed. This actually speaks to the way that God designed us. In fact, Jesus speaks about this. He says this in Matthew 6, 21, that our hearts follow our money. He says, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. These are Jesus' words from 2,000 years ago, and yet they're still so true. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Now, this is one of those verses that you you go, yeah, this kind of makes sense to me even on a practical level. Like if you're in here and you have any kind of investments, you understand this principle. You can learn all about something, but when you are financially invested in it, you have a completely different perspective and outlook. Like maybe you're really into crypto. And if you're really into crypto, you can learn all about crypto. Read all about crypto. But it's very different when you got your money in crypto and then you're watching things changing. Or maybe you have money in other areas, in stocks or ETFs or, or whatever, where you have your money in, in other companies. And guess what you're doing then? You're constantly looking, what's happening here? What's happening with them? What, oh, this person, their CEO announced something. Is that going to impact prices? You pay careful attention. You, you care more because you are financially invested. And the same is true when it comes to church. You care more when you are financially invested in the church. You think like a contributor, not just a consumer. You're not just 
from afar going, you know what, what can I get from this? You're going, I want to help build this. I want to be part of this. You think differently. Now, take it away from even the local church when it comes to Jesus' words here. He's not just sharing a good idea. He's not just stating a fact, going, so, you know, wherever you spend your money, there the desires of your heart will be. And you go, yeah, okay. He's also causing us to do some reflection. He's causing us to ask the question, okay, where is my heart? Where are my desires? Where am I spending my money? And he's causing us to to honestly reflect how intentionally am I being with the resources that I've been given. I mean, how often do we think intentionally about what we have? And how often, on the other hand, do we just find our money coming in and going out? And then waiting for the next time we get paid again to do it all over again. Jesus is inviting us into a deeper way of life, a more life-giving way of life. And regardless of our view of Jesus... His words are true for every single human being. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. It reminds us that how we spend our money is not neutral. It's not neutral. That how we spend our money shapes us. Because how we spend our money, it reveals where we have our identity, where we place our meaning, where we place our security. And as a result of all of that, our money is a reflector of what we worship. It causes us to reflect what are the things that are the most important to me and what are the areas that I have put first in my life. There's a French French sociologist named uh, Jean Baudrillard. I had to to write out phonetically how to pronounce his name because I was like, I first looked at it, I'm like, just stumbling through it, Jean Baudrillard. He argued that in our Western world, materialism is the most dominant system of meaning. Now, this is not a Christian, but he's saying materialism is the most dominant system of meaning. Increasingly in North America, we get our identity by what we own and what we consume. Pay attention, you see it everywhere. I think a lot about the phone that I have. I have an iPhone. And I think about back in 2001 when I was in high school. I was in grade 11. And we had, I got to use a Mac for the very first time to do a bunch of creative work. And it was amazing. And I remember that they're advertising at the time. And and if you've been around for a bit, you would have maybe remembered. It was Think Different. Now, they were speaking to a certain kind of person they were trying to engage. The person that goes, I want to think different. I want to be different. Now notice what Apple's done. People initially were like, if I have a Mac, I'm different. Now everyone has a Mac. And everyone has an iPhone. And if you're in here and you have an Android phone, we look down on you. (laughs) We love you, but we're like, come on. You get to airdrop. There's something in that. There's a status. I mean, there's something when you're sitting in a cafe and you pull open your three, three and a half thousand dollar MacBook Pro and you're like, oh yeah, look at that, it glows. <laughs> we notice this in our life all around us. We see, we have bags that have branding on them or shoes that are worth a whole lot of money or cars or homes. We see this and many of us have become guilty of this where identity, our identity is tied up in the stuff that we have what we consume, and what we own. And increasingly, this has become more and more harmful to how we are formed as human beings. It has not had a a positive effect on us. And it also signals a significant shift in the church. In the 60s, it peaked where there was a, a shift away from cultural Christianity. Most data suggests that in North America, the church was at its peak in the 1960s. And and since then, it has slowly declined. And we've seen the death of cultural Christianity. And maybe you'd know what that is without knowing the language. This was where everyone just went to church because that's what you do. It's not really about going and being transformed or wondering, am I following the way of Jesus? It's just, that's what you do. That's where your friends are. What are you doing on Sunday? Well, nothing's open because we're all at church. 
And since the 1960s, there's been a slow and steady decline. And through COVID, it, it crushed and beautifully crushed cultural Christianity. And so we find in this, this scenario where you go, okay, what do you do with this gap? People were going to church, and they were hearing a little bit about Jesus, and and it wasn't perfect, and it had tons of flaws, but but if we're stopping going to church, if this huge group of people aren't going to church anymore, what fills that place? What becomes the new church? What becomes the new temple? Now, there's a really interesting scenario where we see the death of cultural, cultural Christianity, and I think... I think that this is one of the great gifts for us as a church, where it's not just about consuming, but instead contributing, where it's not just about getting and, and being, but actually becoming and tra- being transformed. But, but what happens in a culture where cultural Christianity actually dies? Uh, same, that same philosopher, Baudrillard, says it, it didn't, they didn't turn to atheism. Because that's sometimes what we think. Okay, so if you walk away from cultural Christianity, then, then you must just walk away from faith completely. You know, do you want to know what people turn to? Shopping. Shopping actually overtook going to church as the number one leisure activity for North Americans. That became the thing that people spent more time doing. And then it, it shifted where you don't just shop during certain hours at the mall, the temple with the glowing fluorescent lights. Now you can hop on Amazon and have access to shopping, consuming all of the time. And I'm not suggesting that any of those things are inherently evil, but when those become the focus of our attention, maybe it should signal a problem. We've moved from sacrifice to excess, from contributing to consuming, from generosity to greed. And so here we find this tension. And it's a great invitation for those of us that really want to embrace a countercultural way of Jesus' life. But we find a tension between this, this pull to generosity and living sacrificially like Jesus did, and then this other part of us that goes, I just want to make sure I'm secure and I'm okay and I have enough and I want people to like me and validate me and I I want to buy that new stuff. And what do we do as we live in that tension? This is where Jesus' words echo and should echo in our mind with more prophetic power than we give credit to. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Jesus' teaching reminds us that living generously with God's kingdom in mind re-indexes our heart towards his kingdom. It shifts our heart towards his way of life. As we live generously, we break some of the power. We embrace in that tension a different way of living. And so if we are constantly being formed by how we spend our money, the opposite is also true. When we use our money to serve God, it counterforms us. I've used that language before, and it's important just to define it, that if we're being formed by all sorts of other things, many of which that are indexing our heart to look like everyone else in the world, Counterformation is the way that God forms us and shapes us and re-indexes our heart to his way of life. Much of the work that Jesus does is counterformation. You've heard it said, but I say to you. We, we have this way of living that we go, this is just how you live. And Jesus goes, who told you that? And so our job as Jesus followers is to continue to go, is it possible that what he's calling me into looks very different than what I've settled into. There is a brilliant book by James K.A. Smith called You Are What You Love. And the byline of the book is The Spiritual Power of Habit. I was rereading it and I was like, man, this book is so, is so valuable because it speaks about we as a culture have treated Christianity like it's just more head knowledge. If I can just know more, believe more, then I will be good. But the problem is there's this disconnect. We might know more and yet not do what we're supposed to do. And so he's talking about habit as a significant part of changing how we live our life in surrender to Jesus. He has a couple of quotes I want to share. First, Jesus is a teacher 
who doesn't just inform our intellect, but forms our very loves. He isn't content to simply deposit new ideas into your mind. He is after nothing less than your wants, your loves, your longings. And the second quote, it is crucial for us to recognize that our ultimate loves, longing, desires, and cravings are learned. And because love is a habit, our hearts are calibrated through imitating exemplars and being immersed in practice, practices that over time index our hearts to a certain end. Okay, so notice what he's saying, because love is a habit. Now that stands in opposition to what we hear in the world, because love is what you feel when things are good, but if things aren't good, then you fall out of love and you love someone different. But instead, what we see is a sacrificial way of love that is habituated, that we love someone sacrificially as a habit. Over time, we continue to say, I'm not going anywhere. This is why Jesus' view of marriage is so significant, because it is a commitment and covenant before the other person going, I am committed. I'm going to love you no matter what. And so we're indexed towards this. Love is a habit. And then he says our hearts are calibrated through imitating exemplars. That is, as we look at people that have gone before us that are actually exemplifying this way of living, we begin to shape ourselves to become more and more like who we want to be. And being immersed in practices that over time index our heart to a certain end. Now just so we're really, really clear, our exemplar is Jesus. Now, as leaders, we want to be the kind of people you can look at, follow me, imitate me as I imitate Christ. But listen, if you look at us, you will see imperfect people. But when you see Jesus, you see an example of how to really live. And so we model our life after him. And we are changed as a result of it. It's not just about the words of Jesus, though those are so valuable. It's also about the way of Jesus. This is why we're talking about practicing generosity. Because the first time that we're generous, it feels a little clunky. And like many spiritual disciplines or practices, the first few times it feels clunky. We only get better as we do it more, as we re-index our heart to the way of Jesus. But it does mean that we actually need to change our habits, not just our thinking. Because we can know that generosity is something we should do. Yes, I should be generous and still find ourselves at the end of the week going, maybe next week, maybe next week I'll be generous. Maybe at some point when things are better and different in a different stage, when I get everything sorted out, then I will live this way. It's important to understand that our habits form our practices which develop our desires. So if we think of ourselves just as people that are brains on a stick, if we just know a little bit more, we miss out that there is this part of us that goes, I need to know and want this. And so if we want to get to a place where we desire to be generous, what does it look like for us to back the truck up a bit and go, what habits am I instilling? What am I actually doing in my life that is indexing my heart towards the way of Jesus? Am I doing any? Is it possible But the, the output I'm currently getting is precisely connected to the inputs that I have? Like many of us, we look at our lives and go, I, I want it to be different than it is. But then we keep doing the exact same things. And I'm not suggesting that you just go, tomorrow I'm giving everything away and I'm going to do it like this. We go, I'm going to pray for 18 hours. I'm barely going to sleep. Like I'm not saying go extreme. I'm saying, what does it look like to begin to do small things that compound over time? What does it look like to actually make it a habit of practicing generosity? See, we can know about the generous way of Jesus and still disregard it. And we know these things instinctively, right? We can know that going to fast food places all the time is not good for us as we're pulling into the drive through And we're like, those McDonald's fries, they just hit a spot. And so we can know, okay, if I want to be healthy and live a long time, I need to eat reasonably healthy. Pass me that burger. We can know that, right? Like, I, I want us to be honest, at least with ourselves, and go, you know, knowing it, knowing the right thing is not the same as doing it. 
or beginning to do it, or trying, or practicing it. If our habits form us we want, and we want to be generous, we need to begin to habituate generosity. Now, this is why, and I'm not suggesting everyone has to do this, but for Lee and I, it's valuable. This is why recurring giving has been important for us. So whether you give monthly or weekly or every time you have a paycheck, for us, it just continues to habituate that we we know that our money is not ours and we want to live generously according to what God's asking us to do. That when we tithe, it's not just something we do when we feel like it. That instead we do it all of the time where it becomes one of those things that you go, that's our habit and it forms and shapes us. And I wonder if you were to look at your own life and more specifically at your bank account or what you're spending, what would you identify as being the most important to you? Now again, I'll just share from our perspective, when, when we get paid our first, the first money goes to God. And that's an intentional thing from our end, because we're just going, God, we want, we want to know from the beginning it's yours. There's some practical parts to that too. If I give from the front... I'm not tempted at the end to go, I could just, I could use a little bit more, a little bit more margin. We could do this. I go, what we have is what we have. It's helpful for us as a habit that produces in us the kind of desire that we want, where we look at our lives and we look at our spending and it reflects more and more the way of Jesus. Over time, our habits shape our choices, our desires, and our lives. And, and I just, I don't see many people accidentally becoming generous people. I don't see people that over time, they're like, yeah, I just, I don't know, I just became generous out of nowhere. I wasn't. And then, I mean, outside of direct in for intervention by God, it's not normally what we do. Instead, we become who we become because of our habits and our patterns and the way we live. And so we may not become generous in, unintentionally, but we do become consumers unintentionally. We go, yeah, I just need to buy a little bit more, get a little bit more, and, and then I'll, I'll buy a little bit more, and then I'll, you know, at some point, but I just, I could use a little bit more. Our habits, they form us into people that value entertainment or stuff more than the creator of the universe. And none of those things are inherently bad, but when they are in first place, not second place, it should be an indicator for us. What we love in our lives, the way that we treat our hearts and what we have is learned. And so are we cultivating the kind of love for people and for God that is sacrificial? The kind of love and, and, and life that goes, it's not about me. It's not about my stuff. Instead, I want God to use me. For many of us in North America, instead of God being our God, money has become our God. Success has become our God. Security, where we find and we worship what we have instead of the one who gave it all to us. Martin Luther, and not Martin Luther King Jr., Martin Luther, who is the father of the Reformation, he pinned a bunch of theses as he separated from the Catholic Church. And, and he had an impact, a significant impact on the Protestant Church. But he says this, whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that is really your God. That's a sobering thing for every single one of us. That is not one of those things you go, yeah, so for you, I go, for me, yeah, what, what's my heart cling to? What's my security found in? Where is my hope found in? And I want to remind you, money is a tool. It can serve us or we can serve it. But Jesus' invitation for us is a way of life where we're no longer defined by the world, but instead defined by our place in his kingdom, our identity placed in him as his sons, as his daughters. And so we're no longer defined by all the things that we have and what people say about us. We are defined by the creator of the universe who gives us breath and life and says, I see you through my son Jesus. You are my son. You are my daughter. You are my beloved. This is the way of Jesus and it's opposite, countercultural of the world. 
And so much of this and the way of Jesus stands in direct opposition to how we're formed in the world. The lie that's at the core of it for so many of us in North America is that having more will fill our souls, will fill the hole that's in us, and then we buy more, and for a little bit it satisfies us, and then we think, you know, a little bit more would be better. A little bit more. And you find yourself trying to fill something that was never meant to be filled by stuff. At the core of it, we are all looking for true meaning. We're looking for identity. Where is my hope found? Who am I? Now, I mentioned it last week, but part of the reason that we avoid conversations around money and we avoid the, 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 especially the difficult conversations of reflecting on how we spend our money and how it's shaping us is because we'd rather avoid it. We would rather not confront the areas in our life that we're trying to medicate. That's a standard human challenge. We find ourselves feeling all sorts of feelings, so we just binge a little more Netflix, and so we feel a little bit better for a moment. Or, or we find ourselves feeling feelings, so we just buy something new and feel momentarily good. And that's a lot easier than actually going, what's below that? What's at the root of that? We have to become people who are increasingly willing to actually do the difficult work of confronting and asking difficult questions in our own life. And there's so much of a tendency for us to look at other people and go, you need to sort that out. I want us to to really make sure we're going, am I paying attention to, to what I'm doing and why I'm doing things and what it's saying about me and who I am becoming? For us, we need to become people that experience transformation, not just more information. I need that. We can't just know more. We need to actually go, what is at the root of this? What lie am I believing? And what truth, God, are you trying to say to me? And here's what I want us to do. And, and, and I, I, I phrased it in kind of a... a, a preachy sermon style thing, but I, it stuck with me. When, this is what I want you to do, and it'll, it'll be on the screen. When you want to buy, pay attention to what you're trying to satisfy. Okay, hopefully that's somewhat sticky for you. When you want to buy, pay attention to what you're trying to satisfy. Next time that you go, you know what? I really want to go to the mall and get that thing, and I'm not even saying that's bad, but pay attention. Am I, am I trying to satisfy something? Am I, am I trying to fix something that actually God's going, hey, uh, l- listen, we could actually do some healing work that would change your life? And you go, no, I'll just numb it. It's fine. Jesus' invitation is not for us to leave our life uninterrupted. He wants to, through the Holy Spirit, search every single area of our life and, and bring light into darkness. And so when you want to buy, pay attention to what you're trying to satisfy. Pay careful attention to that. Let me just share what I'm learning in this. In seasons where I find my identity securely in Jesus, and we go through ebbs and flows, at least I do, and if you're like me, most human beings, we go through flows, times where you go, I'm so, I know who God says I am, I know who, what he's asking me to do, and then other seasons that you kind of go, I think... And then other seasons where you're like, I don't know. And I notice in seasons where I am close, where I am clear, where I am secure in my identity, I don't find myself getting pulled to buy more, get more. But in seasons where I'm not, I absolutely do. I'm like, you know what? My, my truck is like 20-something years old, and, and I would love to have one that's more reliable. But the truth is, it is 100% sufficient to get me down the hill with the trailer and back. But in moments that I find myself drawn into an identity that is unhealthy, I'm like, if I could just get a brand new truck, that'll solve all my problems. If I can just buy that new thing, that'll fix everything in me. And so it causes me to do an inventory. And here's what it becomes for me. When I pay attention to when I want to buy something to try to satisfy something, it becomes like an indicator becomes a a, a flag for me of where my heart is pulled in an unhealthy direction. Uh, We were talking with Britt this week, and and if you've been around me long enough, you know I I often will talk about red flags and then green flags. And she's like, we need to actually get you red flags and green flags. So if anyone wants to make some, and I'll have them up here. 
But when I notice myself wanting to buy and consume more, that's a red flag. That's like a warning light, like the check engine light. Check engine light goes on, you're like, what is going on? Now, what we do and what I do if I'm not self-aware and I'm not healthy is I just go, it's fine, I'll just ignore it or I'll medicate it. But what increasingly God's inviting me to do is not the easy thing, but the difficult thing of going, yeah, what's behind that? And then to be in community where, where I have people that, that I go, okay, here's what I'm wrestling with, and they're able to say, hey, here's what we see, or what about, or have you thought about, and it begins to make you reflect and grow. And so for all of us, we need to pay attention to when we're trying to buy something to satisfy something. When, when we notice our heart shifting or being pulled, it needs to be a red flag of going, what's at the root of this? Am I spending any time with God? And I'm not talking about like going through the motions. Am I actually allowing him to speak to me? To speak to me? Am I in community of people that are, that are helping to become more and more like Jesus? And so we identify areas in our life where there is a, a, a disconnect and there's something that is not quite right that we're trying to fill with something else. And the next part of that is really difficult because some of us go, okay, a difficult thing is just identifying areas of growth. But the real difficult thing is, and then what? Because some of us can be self-aware, but being self-aware without actually beginning to take steps toward correcting something and, and even placing habits in, is a, it's an impartial solution. Again, we can know, but if it doesn't change how we live and the habits we put in place, it doesn't change us. And this is why practices and counterformation for those of us that want to follow the way of Jesus is so important and not something that we'll just do a series on and then leave it. This is why even for us as a church, continuing to Sabbath is essential. That we can't just say that was a good idea and then stop doing it. We need to begin to practice that and over time make that part of our rhythm. This is why practicing generosity isn't just something we do with the intent of going, well, if I could just if I could just pressure them, then that will be good. Instead, what I'm suggesting to you is that this is essential when it comes to discipleship to Jesus, and that's what I want for you. I want us to be apprentices of Jesus. Jesus talks about money a whole bunch because it reflects our heart. I, I don't want us to avoid that. I want us to go, all of us, me included, God, what are you trying to say in the midst of that? To walk into the difficult conversations that we're, we're actually willing to change some of how we live increasingly to change all of how we live so that we look more and more like Jesus. In Mark 10, Jesus does just this, where he confronts and he challenges us. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you must know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. The teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. And I just wonder if he's like, great, check off the list. Like, I'm good. I haven't murdered anyone. Like, win. And then Jesus responds and, and he, said, he looks at him. And Jesus felt genuine love for him. Now, let me just park there for one second and just remind you, if, if you're hearing something and you're like, you know what, I just, I, I do sense there's some disconnect. I, I want you to know Jesus isn't looking at you, nor am I and going, yeah, smarten up. That he looks at you with genuine love. And he says, I want more for you. I want my way of life for you. That Jesus invites us. And so here he does with this man felt genuine love for him, not condemnation, genuine love. And he says, there is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. And he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Maybe you've heard that story before, the rich young ruler, the rich young man. And you've heard that as Jesus interacts with this man and he's able to get to the very root right away. He says, what, what do I have to do? And Jesus gives him the list. He goes, no, I've done that. He's like, perfect. Now just, just one more thing. Sell everything and give it away to the poor. And the guy's like, I can't do that. He, 
poked and prodded and got to the very center of where this man's identity and hope was found. And notice Jesus' challenge here where it's saying, sell everything and give it to the poor. Now, just as an aside, I'm not saying that's what you need to do, but I was reading a book by Randy Alcorn called The Treasure Principle. And he was saying there was this guy who was fairly wealthy who sensed that God was saying, sell your house and give it all away. And so he did something really wise. He brought it to his small group, or in our language, co-group. And he said, this is what I'm sensing. I'm sensing that God is asking me to sell everything and give it away. And so the, the co-group says, don't do that, man. Like, don't give everything away. And he's like, oh, okay, I guess I shouldn't, I shouldn't listen to what God's saying. They're like, yeah, that's radical, man. Like, what are you doing? You don't sell everything. Now, the problem is that Jesus asked the man to sell everything, and I'm not suggesting he's even saying that to you. What I am suggesting is that if he is saying it to you, that you do what he says. Because we can do that sometimes as Christians. We talk people out of actually following what God's trying to say. We go, we go you know what, that seems pretty radical and extreme. And listen, there are times where that's unwise. In this guy's scenario, this guy was wealthy, had resources, had a great job, so if he would have sold everything, he would have been okay. Now, if you're radically in debt and you sell everything and then you're just so far in debt and you're in over your head, I would not suggest that that's wise. But what I would suggest is that we are the kind of people that are actually willing to do what God asks us to do. If he asks us to do something, we bring it we bring it with humility and open hands to our co-group, and we go, this is what I'm sensing, what do you think? And we honestly pray through it. If God is asking us to give sacrificially, we want to do it. Because what happens is over time when we listen to God and don't do what he says, we become numbed to what he's saying. And so if God's like, hey, and, and I doubt it for anyone that's sell your house, but what about those times that God's like, hey, see that person, buy them a coffee. Hey, see that person, give them your fill in the blank. And you're like, God, is that really you? Now, God, has, God is slow and he helps us to, to learn. He's slow to, he's not rushing us. But over time, when we continually go, no, I'm not going to do that, we can't be surprised when he stops actually speaking to us. And so we want to be the kind of people that go, God, small or big, I just, I want to do what you say. I want to, I want to habituate my life and re-index my heart towards your way of life. And so the invitation for each of us is to pay attention to, to when we're trying to buy to satisfy something. And it's also to pay attention to where we're spending our money and what God is inviting us to do with what he's given us. Because you notice in verse 22, at this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. May that not be us. In a culture that defines themselves by what we have and what we consume, let us be the kind of community that represents Jesus, that holds everything that we have with a, a loose hand. Augustine, who is profoundly impactful post-Jesus to the church, says, God is always trying to give good things to us but our hands are too full to receive them. And Jesus says, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. So let's, for us, and in your co-groups, you'll spend some time this week discussing it, actually reflect, how do I spend my money? Am I doing what he asked me to do? Am I putting into place habits that are forming me to fall more and more in love with him, to be shaped, to be generous like our God, or... Am I holding on? And again, let me just be really, really clear. I'm not asking anything of you. The only thing that I would ask is that in your life, you actually ask God and then do what he says. Can you imagine if each of us lived our life in complete dependence with our finances to what God was leading us towards? You know, there's data that suggests that if, if Christians, if all Christians gave sacrificially, that we would eradicate poverty almost immediately. And I just go, is, is that maybe a part of what God is inviting us to do? I want us to walk in step with what God is asking. 